Buddy, it is so good to see you, and I know that that for a long time we'll be seeing you here in Kansas City uh, on a regular basis. But I know that while it's been a lot of years since you played, I always it's interesting with all my years in in Kansas City, I've always seen your name pop up for different things that you're doing outside of baseball or in conjunction with baseball. Tell me a little bit about the post baseball life because you've had a whole other career for a long time. I have. I've been working in uh, multiple sports. In fact, I've gotten to the point now, Joel, if I had to work in one sport, I think I'd get really bored. So I've I've actually worked with athletes in, I think it's 13 pro sports and over 20 amateur sports. We've been able to quantify the zone experience, what happens in the brain when an athlete is playing their best. And it kind of stems from my World Series zone experience, which I played the best I'd ever played. And I had no idea how it happened. And 18 months later, I was out of the big leagues because I didn't know how to repeat it. And so my journey has been to figure it out. And that's now what I teach. We've quantified it, <clears throat> certain processes, of the brain and the nervous system. And so I train athletes to access the zone more by will than by chance. It's, it's such a fascinating story to me because uh, on a lot of levels, first off, you're not just talking about being in the zone for athletes too. It could be uh, athletes, musicians, or I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, really any profession. I mean, don't we all have highs, lows, slumps, hot streaks, and and oftentimes just kind of take what comes to us instead of attempting to control that? Doesn't this really apply to anyone? You know, it does apply to anyone. I've often, uh, when I'm on the golf course working with a, a golfer, they'll an amateur golfer, a businessman, they, they'll turn to me and they, they'll say that this applies to all of life. And I said, absolutely so. So I have started to work uh, more in the business world, not a lot, and, and you know, my primary focus is in sports, but it is ap applicable. And, and certainly, you know, when, when our life is flowing, as, as you know, we're, we're more in that state of allowance, you know, as we, as we take action, we always have to take action, of course, but it's, it's the alignment and that state of allowance that allows things to uh, move more fluidly in our life, things to come to us, manifest, et cetera. So that's, that's the essence of what I teach. And yes, it is applicable to all areas of life. So I, I do want to get into what really took you on this path? Obviously, you just touched on the the motivation of trying to figure out as hot as could be in the zone and suddenly out of baseball. And I, you know, I, I think that anybody that is listening or watching this knows to some level that that baseball is extremely hard. I think they're all all the sports are difficult, but there's something about every day. There's something about the fact that it's not just having to show up. 16 Sundays a year and I'm not I don't mean to minimize that but it's just the fact that over the course of 162 uh, your true colors are gonna show it's not enough just to be in the zone for a little while is that to you what makes baseball so unique because to me it's such a marathon unlike we see in any other sport yeah I agree you know <clears throat> When you do, when you have to do something every day, there's really not a weekend in baseball. You know, we, we used to say the only way you know it's Sunday is by the thicker newspaper, you know. And so, you know, when I think back of that, not that I played every day, but I was suited up every day. Um, you know, the every day, you know, you're out there and, and we're in the per performance industry, right? We're in the um, you know, it's arts and entertainment, right? We're entertaining people. And, and that's a lot of pressure. And, and um for me, I didn't handle it well. It was uh, mentally, it was very draining to me, emotionally draining. And physically, I, you know, I had a bunch of injuries. And so that made it even more difficult. Um, but you're, you're right. It is a very, very unique sport due to the fact that we're, you know, playing 162 games and it can wear you down pretty good. What was for you growing up? What, what was the dream? What, what, what did you hope to do? Well, I knew at a very young age that I wanted to play Major League Baseball. Uh, there was no question. I was five years old and I asked my mother, do I play for the Dodgers and, and then go to college or do, do I go to college and then play for the Dodgers? And of course, she said, go to college and then play for the Dodgers. Well, I didn't go to college and I played for the Royals. I did go to college afterwards a little bit. But um, so, I, yeah, I knew at a very young age that's what I want to do. I never could fathom playing in a World Series. I just it was just kind of beyond the realm of possibility for me. But, uh, you know, found myself playing in that World Series and in 85 and I'll never forget sitting in my locker and with 20 minutes uh, to go before I needed to be in the dugout for introductions. And all of a sudden I got just crushed by this wave of, you know, wave of fear. I was 
paralyzed by it, wondering how in the heck could I catch a ball at shortstop? And it was the first time in my life that I just sat in fear as opposed to mood altering by making myself a sandwich or something else. And I uh, was able to get to the other side of it and, you know, freed me up to really go out and play as well as I've ever played. So it was quite an experience. Well, World Series in 1985, you go five for 18, you draw five walks. You're the shortstop on the Kansas City Royals and the future Hall of Famer, Ozzie Smith, who was the NLCS MVP. George Brett was the ALCS MVP. I mean, think about that. The two MVPs of the League Championship Series were future Hall of Famers, and you're now outplaying in Ozzie Smith. So what did it feel like to be in the quote-unquote zone? I think, you know, a lot of people look back at 85, those that remember it, if you don't, and you're a, a Royals or a Cardinals fan, you've heard about it. You hear a lot about Game 6 and the – the, the Don Dankinger call, and that, that always is where the attention goes, or a young Brett Saberhagen uh, winning the World Series MVP. But what was that feeling like of being in the zone, and, and what was it like to, to sit there and say, boy, I, you know, I, I may be the best shortstop on the field right now. I don't know if you were thinking that way. but <laughs> I wasn't thinking like that, but it felt really uh, special, very, very unique as opposed to the rest of my career. It, um, I was in my own little world. And everything just slowed down. I, I was aware of my teammates and certainly aware of the opponent. But there was uh, the, the great Roger Federer says when he plays his best tennis, he forgets he's at a point. So in essence, I was forgetting that I was playing baseball. Mm. And um, just it was very quiet. I mean, I was aware of the fans, but it was more about me and me and what was going on internally that I was able to access. And, and I literally had the feeling, Joel, that I couldn't do anything wrong even if I tried to do something wrong. It was crazy. The only thing I did wrong, I missed a suicide squeeze my first at bat. But other than that, you know, I really did everything. I, I didn't make any mistakes. Every single ball at shortstop, and I'm not exaggerating, but every single ball hit me right in the sweet spot of the glove. And every throw I made came out of my hand like butter off a hot knife. And I'll never, re I'll never forget there was a play in St. Louis. I don't know it was game five or maybe game four where there was some, someone stole a base and Frank White took the throat second and the ball kicked away from him in the left center field. And I went out to retrieve and I just picked it up kind of on the run and wheeled and threw and made a, you know, kind of, a, a, you know, it was a perfect throw to Frank to keep the runner at second. And um, I recall the feeling, you know, it's not, a, that wasn't a difficult play by me, but I recall the feeling I had afterwards was like, you know what? I think I could have kicked the ball to him and it would have gone exactly where I wanted it. It was that, that kind of, uh, experience where there was something that really overtook me that allowed my full ability just to surface. And I used to think, you know, a lot of people thought that I might've played over my head in that series. And, you know, I was open to belief in that as well. But now that I understand that, you know, the brain and the brain body connection, I realized, no, I didn't play over my head. I was just able to access my full ability and, you know, true. I, I picked a good time to do it in the world series, but, um, that's something that is accessible by all of us. It's interesting, too, because looking back, and you would remember a, a moment like the the missed squeeze much more than me, but looking back right now at the play-by-play, -play, bottom of the second inning, and, you know, this is game one of the World Series. I mean, the Royals have finally made it, and and they're going up against the Cardinals, I-70, and, and, and now here you guys go. Sumberg walk, Motley single, Balboni single, it's one nothing. And and you got uh, Daryl Motley on third, and suddenly he's caught stealing at home, and you miss an opportunity, which you know, uh, especially as a guy that's not being paid to hit home runs, that you have to be able to do that. And, and so do you remember the thought at that point? Because if, if you were about to be in the zone or were in the zone, that was certainly not a zone-like moment. No, it wasn't a zone-like moment. In, in essence, it was, and I'll explain why here in a moment. But the thing that I recall is I – I wasn't aware that John Tudor had a, a two seam fastball and he ran a fastball low and away from me and my legs were not in a strong position to, to go down and, and, and make sure that I got the bat on the ball. So um, that certainly wasn't a zone moment, but the, the thing that was a zone moment was when I, I ended up striking out that at bat. And I remember walking back to the dugout and I thought to myself that something was different, mm -hmm. that I saw the ball much more clearly that things slowed down much more so for me. And after that was how I experienced the entire series is everything slowing down and I wasn't thinking and, and my swing and my play at shortstop was more fluid and effortless than ever before. And the timing, the ball coming out of my hand and everything else. 
was better than I had ever experienced. And so I, you know, it's kind of led to what, what we do now, because if, if you ask a hundred athletes in any sport, how they felt when they played their best, if they take the time to think about it, well, typically describe in those three ways that things slowed down. They had more time and two, they weren't thinking they were just reacting and three, their motion was more fluid and effortless. So the timing was really good or even perfect. And so if that's what's taking place when you're playing your best, it would only make sense for it to be your priority. And that's a process in, in the mind that, that uh, is accessible. So before I get to your post baseball and zone motion and everything that, that you have taken from that career and you know, as well as I do that any time in the big leagues is time that pretty much no one in the world has. I, I always say a, a cup of coffee is more than what anybody's ever going to get. You had more than that. I, I know that the career didn't last as long as you probably expected it to, but you also, you have a world series ring. You had those moments. We'll talk about your big famous TV moment a little bit later in the podcast, but it also sprung this whole second career. The first part of this question is how mentally, and I, I think that's the right word, how mentally challenging was it to have reached that that high and then to have fallen like you did? Uh, easy to look back, I'm sure, and reflect now and have, have years and decades to do that. But in the moment, as a young kid still, uh, what was that like? Yeah, it was, you know, I just did it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I paid attention to the difficulty. I just like put my... Uh, my shoes on and, and, and went after it um, every day, but it was, it was difficult. Uh, you know, I had, there was plenty of depression and anxiety and, and, and not understanding how to deal with those types of things. Now there's just so much more knowledge available to all of us to deal with the challenges that life can throw at us. But it was, um, it was definitely a challenge, you know, not knowing where to look for uh, the help. And not only that, I had some physical issues. I, I wasn't aware of, you know, I had a lot of concussions as a child and, and I wasn't aware of what was impacting me. So it's the difficult thing about, uh, I think, humanity and our figuring ourselves out is, you know, what's causing what? When we don't feel our best, what is in the way? And um, so that's kind of in my journey is figuring out, OK, what's in the way and you know, how do we feel better and how do we enter the zone and, and play our best? So. You're obviously many, many years since your baseball career, but I, I feel like from the moment I got here in Kansas City and you start hearing names and, and learning about people and, you know, the past, the history of the team, and, and I feel like, you know, any time the, the, the study of the brain and science and sports and the zone comes up, I'd always heard your name. And, of course, you and I have met and talked since, and, and so I, I'd love to pick your brain on this, no pun intended, but – how, what was the process like for you to get from athlete to, to expert, so to speak? It wasn't pretty. <laughs> you, like I say, you don't, you don't do what I do because it was smooth sailing every step of the way. You know, there were, there was a lot, there were a lot of hard times um, <clears throat> along the way, but um, you know, we are, the human spirit is very interesting and we, you know, I was out seeking and, you know, seeking you shall find. Right. And so I, I was really seeking to to feel good, um, and so I was, you know, looking. I had to because of my head injuries. I had these concussions. I was very cut off. It was very hard for me to know if I was putting my right foot forward, you know, in, in steps that I was taking in my life. So I was able to develop a lot of um, a lot of other ways to get information, um, get answers, um, heal the brain body connection, heal the brain. And th through that, to really free myself up to, you know, to what I do now, to um, to be more of what we, we're all capable of being. You know, we all have some limitations and none of us want the limitations. And, and um, but, you know, f figuring out what needs to be done to access more of who we really are and our full ability. Is the zone like, look, I can't I can't hit a hundred mile an hour fastball never have been able to and if i was in the zone and in the perfect frame of mind i still don't think that i could do that like you know you you, you can't dunk a basketball if you're five foot three or whatever unless you're spud webb or right. bugs and bugs or you know those guys but how often do we as humans hurt ourselves or limit our abilities based on what's going on upstairs 
Oh, I would say uh, it depends on who the human is, right? Number one, I would say most, I would say probably 99% of the time. There, it's, there are some real subtleties in the brain and our whole physiology that make a massive difference. It's not, it's not the big things that make the big difference. It's some little, little subtle energies. And when we start to master those energies, it's amazing what can happen in our ability to create what we want in our life. And it's so easy to think that whatever we're not achieving on our outer life is because of something outside of ourselves. And so what I've realized is it's always an inside job. There's never an exception. I was telling a story to uh, my friend, David Meltzer. You've probably seen David on LinkedIn. He's all over. Yeah. So David's a good friend. And I was sharing a story with him the other day that <clears throat> I've gotten to the point now where if anything is not going the way that I want it in my life, I take full responsibility. There's never an exception. And I actually, I've actually gotten to the point where a, a year ago I was driving up in the Napa Valley and I was in the left lane. I was coming to an intersection and I all of a sudden I realized I needed to be in the right lane to turn right. And I put my blinker on. I started to edge over and the guy in that lane next to me sped up and wouldn't let me in. And my first response was like, what, what the hell's, you know, what's going on? Right. And I immediately said, no, what's going on in me? You know, yeah. and I, and I, I knew, and now this sounds, you know, hard to believe and that's fine. <laughs> this is my experience, right? It's not everybody's experience. This is my experience. I immediately said, Oh, what's going on in me that caused that to happen? And I knew that I was just mis a little misaligned that day, not far misaligned, but a little out of alignment. And I've gotten to the point that that's how I look at life. If something's not happening for me that I want to have happen, it's nobody else's fault. It's not the coach's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's not your wife's fault or your girlfriend's fault. It's my fault. It's in me. And so shifting that energy so that we're better able to create the life we want, it's essential. Well, I also think that, and sort of getting back to the whole damaging yourself, self-inflicted wounds, you know, like I don't know what it's like to step into the batter's box. I mean, I was nervous just doing a, like Royals father's trip one year at Camden Yards, and I'm stepping in because they have all of us, including us broadcasters, hitting with the dads. And I got Ned Yost and Wade Davis sitting behind the cage, but basically heckling me. And I'm like, okay, now... <laughs> Now I'm getting even more nervous, and thank goodness uh, Dale Swaim, a guy that uh, uh, grew up your neck of the woods, I think, or right. a California guy, and, and thank goodness he knew how to hit my bat. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I can only imagine what that's like when it's coming in at, you know, 92, 95, 98, and it might be curving and it might be sinking and all this type of stuff. But uh, the point is when you're in your own head, you don't give yourself the best chance. And so – I like to tell people this all the time that in my early years in television, I was kind of the role player. You know, I, I was the backup anchor. I was the backup to the weekend anchor and I loved the reporting and everything I was doing, but I really wanted to get that resume tape. I wanted to have stuff in the studio so that once a month or once every two months that I got to anchor a couple of shows, I had the weight of the world on my shoulders, not because anybody else said it because I did and I'd be nervous and I'd mess up. And there just came a certain point in my career where I'm just like, you know what? Go have fun. Like, who, yeah. Wh why does it have to happen right now? It really reminds me of what I've always heard George Brett say, try easier, which, yeah. which is so counterintuitive to the way we think, isn't it? Well, tr try, trying is a, is a word I don't use. You know, I, I like the word allowing because trying, trying represents effort. And so when we're performing our best, it, it is, for the most part, effortless with some action. Detachment with action is, is what I call it. Um, so, I, you know, I like to say there's an inverse relationship between strong intention and execution, meaning what it is that you want to execute in order to give you the best chance to execute it. You cannot strongly intend to execute it. Right. And so but there has to be some intention. The whole key. And this is the zone is intention with abstraction when the, when the mind is just very open and very in a very abstract state, which is how an athlete experiences when they're playing their best. But there's some intention. That's what we want to create. That's the state we want to be in. And, you know, that's part of the zone. I always say the zone is not the flow. The zone is, in sports, I should say, the zone is mechanics based on physics, proper angles, with the brain in the right state. And then everything integrates very, very quickly, very well, uh, and really increases the, <clears throat> the integration 
of the mechanics and expedites development. But when the mechanics are not based on physics and or the brain is in the, the wrong state, it's a slower boat to China. And uh, if the brain's in the right state and mechanics are not based on physics, then, then it's a problem as well. So it's, it's, little, it's both. So two more questions about, about your career, your company, Zone Motion, and everybody can find out more information at zonemotion.com. First off is this, when I start hearing an athlete or a former athlete talking about tissue and injuries, I'm, I'm thinking about being on the training table or the massage mm -hmm. table and all of that. I know that that is not quite what you're talking about. So tell me about, about the importance of, of tissue. Well, years ago, I was only working with hitters. And then the St. Louis Cardinals gave me a few pitchers to work with. Um, one of them was Adam Ottavino at the time, who was in the minor leagues. And I began working with a lot more pitchers. And what I noticed was not only were they performing better, but they, they weren't getting injured at a time where injuries were skyrocketing, Tommy John surgeries, et cetera. And so I, I started to think about why that was happening. And I realized that while well, I was teaching something that allowed for more fluid motion, and if something is more fluid, there's less strain. And if we're talking about the body being fluid, there's less strain on the ligaments and the tendons and the muscles and the fascia. And so guys just weren't getting hurt. And so I wrote a long email to Bud Selig, uh, who was right at the end of his term. And um, with all the anecdotal evidence that I had and testimonials, et cetera, et cetera, and saying that what I was doing, I felt was a very, very, um, was the primary solution to the injury epidemic taking place with pitchers. And it was very beneficial in helping them stay healthy. And he got back to me in a couple of days after receiving the email. And he, he said he was on his way to New York to meet with Rob Manfred, the outgoing commissioner, the incoming commissioner at the time. And they would be in touch with me. And they were. They um, put me in touch with their the lead MLB doctor, Dr. Gary Green at UCLA. And we had some conversations. And one thing led to another, led to a research project, the American Sports Medicine Institute. Uh, Dr. Andrews, uh, who's the go-to orthopedic surgeon for Tommy John surgery. And um, <clears throat> their research institute headed up by Dr. Glenn Fleisick, the biomechanist. We did a study with 17 college pitchers and it was very successful in, in the fact that there was no change in the biomechanics, but by the answers that all the pitchers answered on the questionnaires post training, they all had uh, really good experiences in reporting less fatigue and the ball was coming out of the hand better and less shoulder discomfort, less elbow discomfort. It was, it was very, very successful. Um, which led me to some EMG work to measure muscle activity, in which we saw a decrease in the lat and increase in the pec. And an orthopedic surgeon there in Kansas City, Dr. Kevin Woody, who actually trained under Dr. Andrews and does Tommy John surgery, analyzed the research and said, this shows this would mean that there's more support for the shoulder and therefore we can assume the elbow. And so <clears throat> there, there are many benefits to the training. And, and certainly one of them is, is, you know, enhancing the chances of keeping somebody free of soft tissue injuries. We've had huge success and we've had one oblique pull in 14 years, a guy in Japan, mm. just two starts. We've had two Tommy John surgeries in 14 years. And so, you know, we share this information with teams and, you know, they're interested, you know, I, you know, Major League Baseball is, is they're very enamored with biomechanics, which is great. Nothing wrong with that. It's very important. And analytics, it's all great, but there's a missing link and it's the process of the brain. And that to me is the great unknown. And I know it's not totally unknown, but, you know, I had a, a guest back in March that, uh, you know, Marine who had been hurt, traumatic brain injury. And then he talked about how much attention we, we focus on the body from the neck down and how much we know about all those injuries and all that. You've had concussions. I've had concussions. None of them are the same. And it's it's so challenging because it's not as simple as, Hey, just go out there and do this, and you'll be back in four to six weeks. So you're back in day to day. It's like I can't tell you how many times I've had an athlete say to me, you know, after getting hit in the head, usually a middle infield or something, you know, collision type of thing. And no, I mean, I, I think I'll be okay by tomorrow. I'm like, no, you won't, because uh, we just we don't we don't know. I mean, it's it's such yeah. a great unknown. You may know more than a lot of others. But I just we have such a long ways to go with it. Uh, my last question about zone motion for the moment is I know it's not all baseball. Uh, you referenced uh, Roger Federer just in terms of a, a tennis reference before. But I know that that you've worked with a lot of different types of athletes. 
Uh, who who all do you work with, and do you do you have a favorite type of that? Not type of athlete, but favorite uh, sport that you work with? Um, you know, I always enjoy working in baseball. I love working with baseball pitchers because <clears throat> it's amazing when you start to master the processes of the brain. It's amazing what you can do with the baseball. Yeah. I've got a client who throws seven or eight different pitches. Professional client, you know, and it, it's. It's just, yeah, it's just amazing what can happen. The increase in spin rate, we've showed an increase in spin rate of about nine and a half percent. You know, spin rate's a byproduct of obviously arm, arm speed, arm strength, the kinetic chain and the processes of the brain that allow the ball to come out of the hand just the way we want it. Um, I, I really enjoy working with golfers because it's such a, it's such a difficult game. You know, I mean, and all the time that they have in between shots, there are no guaranteed contracts. They're traveling by themselves. But just their caddy, um, it's, it's very difficult. So I really enjoy working in the golf world, and you know, I just I really enjoy working in all the sports that I've been able to work in. And and I just did a, a clinic uh, in Maryland uh, last week with some divers, uh, some really top international divers, and just loved uh, doing that because they're, you know, uh, there's precision. Is where where there's precision, I really love to spend time and just try and really help them master that, that really specific points that are so important in motion. I want to hit the baseball themed questions. Now, every now and then I'll have an athlete, former athlete that could really answer the question in terms of business or on the sports field, at least if it's a baseball player. So I'll ask it and I'll let you go over you want. What's the biggest home run that you've hit in your career? Well, you're, you're, you're not saying uh, literally, right? There were six of them it, in the big leagues. Right. I was going to say, it, it, it could, in your case, it could be, in most people's case, it's figurative. In your case, it could be literal or figurative, even if the literal part is, is one of six. <laughs> All right. So li- literally, the biggest home run, I'm not even sure. I don't think I ever hit, uh, hit, hit one up Don Sutton when he was going for his 300th win on Game of the Week. That's ego. That's my ego because it was game of the week. <laughs> I'm not sure it made a difference in the game. <laughs> no, and a future Hall of Famer. <laughs> and a future Hall of Famer, yeah. And so sad that he passed at such a young age. Yeah. Um, recently. Uh, and figuratively, what I do now, you know, no, no question about it. Yeah. It's uh, n- nothing compares to that. You live in a world of swings and misses. I'm not talking about your, your baseball career. I'm talking about managing failure and and working through that and you had to deal with it on the baseball diamond as everyone does that's why i think it's it's just the most amazing sport because you have to manage failure 70 to 80 percent of the time at least at the plate what's the biggest swing and miss you've taken at, at whatever point in life and what did you learn from it well probably um two two divorces you know where you just learn You've got, you know, we've got to ma- when you've got to master yourself to, to really, um, to get along in relationship with others, you know, and accept others. You know, you've, to accept others, you've got to first accept yourselves. And I think there's so many of us that really don't completely accept ourselves, and we don't accept our flaws. It's one thing trying to rid yourself of your flaws, but it's a real problem when you're not accepting your flaws. And I think what people do is they will start to um, project those flaws on other people, which will affect your relationships. So, um, you know, mastering relationships and mastering our emotional state, you know, so that we can come from a place of love and, you know, unconditional love so that uh, we give others the freedom to be who they are so they can then grow to the person they're supposed to be and want to be. Yeah, that's deep advice and and, and advice that, applies to all of us the last baseball theme question is small ball it's what i wrote the book on the little things that add up to the big things it was really inspired by by the royals or by players like you that that were paid to be able to play good defense to be able to lay down that punt, even if it didn't happen in that one i I know that those are the things that that you were able to do to add value to your team and sure we all know about the home run hitters but shoot how many times did george brett play small ball and not need to hit the home run and so what are in life or business the little things that add up to the big things? Well, for me, it's making sure that I'm aligned, you know, every day, aligned energetically, that my my mind's in a good space, doing doing the 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 things, the practices, 
that I use to make sure that, you know, I'm feeling good, that the mind and body practices, I, you know, take, taking care of the body is essential and being an ex-athlete, the body can be a little, you know, a little, uh, a little achy at times. So just doing a lot of work on the mind and body to make sure that the nervous system stays in a, in a good space so that I can uh, put my best for, foot forward for all those that matter to me, which, is, you know, a lot, a lot of clients and a lot of loved ones. Okay, four final questions now as we round the bases, and I want to take you back to the 1978 baseball draft. If we are willing to admit that the best player eventually in that draft, who I believe was drafted as a third baseman but went on to be a Hall of Fame shortstop, was Cal Ripken. Can we agree on that for starters? I thought he was drafted as a shortstop, but he might have been drafted as a third base. He played shortstop in A-ball against me that two years later. So, okay. but yeah, yeah, for no, no doubt about it. I would agree with that. I, okay. So Cal Ripken jr. And, and he might've been drafted as a shortstop. I might be wrong on that, but at least baseball reference lists him as a third baseman. Although maybe that's based on where he ended his career. I don't know. Uh, but the point is, is I always love it when Rex Hudler, one of my broadcast partners talks about how he was drafted ahead of Cal Ripken. Now I've never heard him say he's better than Cal Ripken. I've just heard that he, <laughs> says that he got drafted ahead of Cal. He also was drafted ahead of of you. What did you know about a, a young Rex Hudler, a couple of California guys drafted in the first round at shortstop? There were some pretty good players, by the way, drafted in the first round. I, I think probably the, the, the first overall pick, Bob Horner, but you could also say Kirk Gibson, a guy that helped recruit Hud to Michigan State, didn't end up there. What do you remember about a young Hud? Well, I, I knew him from California, and I knew that he was – I thought he was going to go to Notre Dame to play, but am I mistaken? He, well, yeah. Oh, he was working at Michigan State and Notre Dame. He was going to go to Notre Dame. Uh, either way, he was going to tick off Gibson. <laughs> right. You don't want to tick off Kirk Gibson, right? We've seen that. Right. So, um, no, he – Kirk uh, – Hud, he – you know, we played against each other in A-ball, and, and um, he could fly. I mean, he was really, really fast. And uh, and it just as we all know, right, who, who doesn't love Rex Hudler? but he better return my phone call soon. Otherwise we've got problems, Joel. Well, first off, we got to teach him how to use the phone. So I'll work <laughs> on that. <laughs> and we'll go from there. All right, right. Second question. All in good fun. Of course, uh, none of us are as funny as the guy that you shared. I think your, your most famous moment with, and, and I say that with all the affection in the world, because I, I mean, David Letterman, unbelievable. And I know that that you were forever known as the guy that ended up on David Letterman. Look for it, everybody. Go go Google it, and you'll you'll find it if you're if you're too young to remember it. Tell me about the David Letterman experience. Well, it began in uh, August of '85. We were in Chicago playing the White Sox. I got a phone in my room one morning from a, a sports writer wanting you know a comment for me about uh, what happened the night before on the David Letterman show, which I hadn't seen at the time. And Letterman had this hit counter, and it was at the same time that Pete Rose was chasing Ty Cobb's all-time hit record. And so he brought out this hit counter and said, there's also a young player, meaning me, chasing Cobb's record. And so he had this little blue box, and he had a picture of Pete and a picture of me. And underneath our photos, he had the number of hits. And Pete had, you know, whatever, 4,300 something. And I had maybe 50 at the time, if that. And so every now and then he'd bring it out. He said, let's, you know, let's check the box scores. Oh, Pete had two hits and he'd hit the hit counter. He said, oh, and Buddy had a hit. And I don't know how often he did it, but um, it culminated with my World Series experience and going on the show. But I wanted one funny thing that I, I, a story I love to share was my mother was a very naive, wonderful, wonderful woman, but a little naive and, and very innocent. <clears throat> uh, a writer called her and said, you know, Letterman's poking fun at your son, you know, how do you, are you offended by that? And she just, she said, well, if it were a higher rated show, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> so Letterman, read, Letterman loved it, you know? And, uh, and then I had a good quote. I thought, actually, I think quiz gave me a good quote. He said, tell him you're, you're closer to Carson, or excuse me, you're closer to Rose than he is to Carson. Because Letterman always took a backseat to Johnny Carson in those days. Yeah. So, yeah. But it was it was a fun experience going on the show after the World Series, and it it was it was fun. Yeah, and people just go to YouTube and and 
punch in David Letterman, Buddy Biancolano. You will find it, trust me, and it's it's worth your time. A a young, but you've aged, aged well, by the way. But, hmm. you know, that was a very young looking, and I was looking at the stats too. It probably was somewhere around 50 hits for the career at that <laughs> right. point. And also when you, you know, when you talk about that line from your mom so innocently saying that, it kind of reminds me of the way that, that Dave used to always have the shtick with his mom. Like just, just pure, yeah, innocent. Right. Anyone can picture their mom saying that. Yeah, I recall you know, that now. He did have that relationship with her, yes. Right, just that endearing way. I mean, it just like just it just feels good. Um, third question, as we round the bases, I know that you co-authored uh, the book, The Seven Secrets of World Class Athletes. What is, I don't know if this is fair or not, what is, what is the greatest secret? So the greatest secret is that <clears throat> your desired result cannot be your priority. Mm. Nor, nor can the mechanic. The physical mechanic cannot be your priority or the desired result. And so what's happening in baseball with pitchers, this is the reason for the arm injury epidemic, the primary reason. As the industry has learned more about, quote, good or perfect mechanics with pitchers and gone to teach them, what we've seen is an increase in injuries, right? And, the, and it's... Of course, they need to be taught. I'm not criticizing anybody for teaching good mechanics. It's, it's a good thing to do. However, when the attention becomes on the mechanic, whatever it is, or the desired result, it creates a muscle imbalance as opposed to the processes of the mind being in the proper state. Then there's fluidity of motion. So you combine the fact that there's so much attention on the mechanics, along with the fact that these athletes are bigger and stronger than ever before, it's a train wreck. And you combine that with the fact there's so much emphasis on velocity and spin rate, that's a problem. The operating system to the muscles is in the brain. The operating system our whole life is in the brain. If it's not your priority, you're just rolling the dice in life to some degree. That, that's so true. And, and again, applies to, as you said, at life, not just baseball or sports. Final question, the walk-off, it's the big one. We hear it so often in, in any sport. But certainly in baseball, we hear all the time that that baseball, like I'm, I'm hearing HUD right now, that baseball looks like a beach ball, you know, or, or or you can't see it at all. How would you describe the feeling of being in the zone? It's a state of really not knowing um, <clears throat> what you're really doing that's allowing you to have that much success. It's a state of allowance and freedom complete freedom as you're, as things are really clicking. Everything that you, you're you wanting is, is happening for you. It's coming to you. So I just really, I love that, you know, I say the state of allowance, that's the key. Everyone, no matter what they do in life, loves that feeling of being in the zone where it's just all clicking. And as Buddy has said uh, over and over again through the last 35 to 40 minutes, it, it, it begins, it all focuses on the brain and so much of the mental aspect of it, something that we all can improve on. If anyone wants more information about Buddy beyond the David Letterman appearance, beyond the baseball reference and the and the baseball stats, just go to the website, zonemotion.com, zonemotion.com. Buddy, I'm so glad that we were able to do this, be able to provide a a really interesting and unique perspective and equally, or maybe more important, I'm excited to have you back in Kansas city on a, on a regular basis, which means that we'll see you at the ballpark, see you in the community, get together a little bit. Thanks so much for spending time on rounding the bases. Well, thanks for having me, Joel. I just want to congratulate you on all you're doing. You're doing great work, you know, with these, with these companies around Kansas city. I just hear wonderful things from a lot of people. So I appreciate you taking the time to have me on. Well, I appreciate it. It's great to be able to visit. And for anyone that has one of those companies in Kansas City or works for them, zonemotion.com would be a good place to start. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Joel.